All right, everybody, welcome to, well, I guess this would be day 106. It's, uh, yeah. This is my, all, I just got back my blood test results. My final blood test results from my 100 days of keto chow. So, I'm doing it out here in the warehouse because there's way too much stuff going on in there, so. And I guess I could lock myself into my little office, but eh, this works better. So. Let's talk about the whole experiment, getting to end. So I've got notes. It's actually the blog post that accompanies this video. So back in December of 2018, I decided I would do a, another experiment. Um, find out some more in depth what was going on with the different types of fat, um, do some science, lose some weight, all that fun stuff. So, um, I decided to do it starting January 2nd because that would happen to coincide with a weight loss challenge that was going on in my city, and I wanted to win. Last time I did that, um, I actually got second place fairly easily. Um, not as many people knew about keto back then, so it was a lot easier to, uh, to yeah, um, also, last time I leveled the playing field, um, I went off keto for a couple days beforehand, um, basically to, re to uh, get my glycogen levels, which is um, glucose and water, back up to normal levels. Then I would lose a lot of water weight. I didn't do that this time. Um, anyway, I started at 244 pounds. Uh, 244, let's see. Look at my... Fancy logs, fancy logs. 244.016 pounds. Um, over the course of the next 100 days, I would end up losing 43.909. It was an average of 0.439 pounds a day. Strangely enough, uh, during the first 80 days of the experiment, I was actually averaging closer to half a pound a day. Then I kind of stalled out a little bit and then kept started going again. Um, in addition to losing the weight, like I said, I wanted to also do a bit of um, science with it. Um, the, the cool thing about using Keto Chow as my only source of nutrients is that it iso I'm able to isolate out variables. Um, in this case, I was changing around the type of fat that I was using. Um, originally, during the first 42 days of the experiment, um, I was just concentrating on losing weight um, with no regard for anything else. And that's actually where I, so I, it should have been 300 consecutive meals of just keto chow for all of my food. I, it ended up being 298 consecutive meals because I think it was during the first week or two, um, I actually missed two meals. Um, there was, yeah. Twice, I just, I actually completely forgot to eat. And at the end of the day, I was like, huh, okay. Um, later on, during the science phase, um, I made certain that I ate all three meals a day, which a couple times meant I was eating at 10 o'clock at night, which sucked. Um, anyhow, so, and interest, also interestingly enough, um, another Keto Chow user decided that she wanted to do the experiment as well. So it wouldn't be an N equals one experiment, it would be an N equals two, which is also very interesting. Um, I'm about six feet tall, I'm a dude, I'm about 42 years old. Beverly, on the other hand, the one who wanted to do it, she's, I'm trying to remember how tall she is, uh, lower five feet. Um, not five, I, I think she might be five one or five two. Um, she's older than I am and she's female. So our caloric requirements were vastly different. Um, our blood marker levels going into the experiment were different and our responses to the different types of fats were also different, though they tended to coincide pretty well. Um, I would usually have more of a reaction to different things and she would have less, but they would still kind of mirror each other. So, um, 
Now, the, as far as the experiment go, the methodology I wanted to use was for the first six weeks, the plan was that I was going to be concentrating on just losing weight. Um, from there going forward, after the six weeks, um, I would do two weeks of the different fat sources that I had planned. Um, so for the first two weeks, it would be just heavy cream. Um, then I would switch to just avocado oil for two weeks. Uh, then I would take out, I would swap 15 milliliters of that avocado oil for MCT oil for the next two weeks. And then the plan was to use butter as a fat source. My tile is beeping. That's great. Um, Got to move things around my pocket. There we go. But you do. Um, anyway, so I would be doing that for the, uh, the fat source. And I wanted to do butter because one of the, uh, the confounding factors with uh, doing a ketogenic diet, a lot of people will use MCT oil. And MCT oil tends to, well, it tends to really mess with your lipid panels. Um, and I had a suspicion that MCT oil was what was causing, from my previous experiments that I'd done, it, it was what was causing some of the issues of my higher triglycerides and whatnot. Um, so I wanted to put it to a test and I wanted to have a longer period because in the previous experiment I'd only done each type of fat for one week. So I wanted to do it for two weeks. So um, um, I had originally planned to do a DEXA scan at the outset and a DEXA scan at the end as well as a resting metabolic rate at the beginning and at the end. And I'd also planned to scale up my calories during the experiment. Didn't get around to those. Um, I did uh, get a DEXA scan at the end, and it is interesting to see how that compares to my um, the DEXA scan I got last year, about a what, eleven, no, thirteen months earlier. Um, during the course of the science phase, um, I and Beverly, um, because she was mirroring all of this, just with lower calories. <laughs> Um, we would both be getting blood tests and because today I just got my final blood test results we're gonna talk about what it what it shows so um, I was also tracking my weight using a white things scale um, which was sold to Nokia for a while then they sold it back to the original owner that's kind of a funny back and forth um, I was checking my blood ketones with a keto mojo and, and glucose with a Keto Mojo meter. Um, and I was also checking my breath acetone using a level breath acetone meter. Um, oh, I also took body measurements using a Zozo suit. Um, it's this strange black jumpsuit like thing that has all these white dots on it. And... <laughs> Basically, you uh, you put it on. It has all these dots, and you kind of stick your arms out, and you go in a circle. And when you go in the circle, um, you have your phone set up on a little stand. It's taking photographs, and then it calculates a 3D model of you. It gives you a whole bunch of measurements. Uh, the idea is that you can then use those measurements to buy custom fit clothing. Um, in this case, I had no interest in the custom fit clothing. I just wanted a way to very easily get some good, uh, apparently fairly accurate measurements. Um, so that's what I was using. Um, you can see the, uh, the beginning and the end 3D model of what it looked like on the, uh, on the, the blog post, that it, well, blog post page, on the page that accompanies this video. So, um, now all of the readings, all of the ketone stuff, blood tests, everything, all of the data from this experiment is all on a publicly accessible spreadsheet. Um, it's linked all over the place. Um, I have all the data from my previous experiments as well as this experiment. I have all of Beverly's data that she shared. It's just all out there for everyone to see, along with graphs and everything else. So, um, 
Now, I also, during the course of the experiment, was doing um, a daily video, well, most, mostly daily, how about that, video update, um, where it, I, I was talking about what was going on, what was happening in my life, how the experiment was going, mostly what was happening, because the experiment, it was pretty blasé. It was, I mean, I was eating keto chow three meals a day and not much to report. Um, I'll get into some of the um, results and whatnot um, in just a bit. As far as the experience goes, um, I had someone ask what what things would they want to look out for as far as if they wanted to do their own 100-day experiment like this. Um, and I told them that, well, number one, socially it can be kind of a drag to do just eating liquid meals. Um, especially if someone has made something special for you, taken a lot of time to make a special meal. Um, tell people ahead of time so that they know what to expect. Um, we went to a, uh, a couple dinners and right as soon as we got there, I explained to the host or to the, in, in some cases, the chef saying, hey, I want to let you know that your stuff looks amazing, but I'm doing a, a nutrition experiment right now um, where the only thing I'm eating is a liquid diet. So I, I won't be able to eat any of your stuff. I'm sorry. And people were always really understanding. Um, when we would go to restaurants, um, I would explain to the waiter that, hey, I'm just drinking tonight, soda, generally diet soda, <laughs> um, and they were always like, okay, I, it was kind of a, well, that's one less thing, I, one less order I have to take, that's cool, um, and that, so it always, that always worked out fine, um, but it's, some people do kind of get funny about you not eating. Um, it's, it's a little bit uh, like the way they get funny when you tell them you're not eating bread because you're on a keto diet. Um, so if you're used to telling people you don't eat bread, expect that all over again, <laughs> but even more so. Um, from a digestive standpoint, um, really the, okay, so some people get the runs if well, doing three meals of keto chow a day, if you do two a day, or if you do three a day just every once in a while, your body, most people, it's fine. It's like, okay, whatever. There's something that seems to be fundamentally different about doing three meals a day. Um, some people, it gives them the runs. Some people, it makes them constipated. It's just really weird. Um, and for most people, the best way to fix that is with a probiotic. And I knew that, and I think it was, well, it wasn't until about day 12 or so that I finally took my own advice and started taking a probiotic. And pretty much all of my digestive issues went away, what, which ones there were, which was I had the runs, in case you wanted to know. Um, make sure you have a good supply of blender bottles. Um, I think we have 40, maybe even 50 blender bottles at our house. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the next thing, which is, um, m well, <laughs> make, uh, yeah, our, our kids, was it, was it, yeah, if, yeah, make sure you have a good supply of blender bottles, especially if your kids like to swipe your keto chow but don't like to mix replacements. I think we have like 40 at our house. I, I put 30 bottles, not children, that swipe keto chow. Um, our kids, well, when they're on the run, they need to grab stuff. They just grab keto chow out of the fridge. And oftentimes they grab mine, which can be a problem if it's one that I like weighed out exactly how many grams of fat are in it. And they're just like, yoink. I'm like, oh man, you took my chow. So... Uh, but to that point, also learn how to um, prepare keto chow in bulk. Um, me personally, and I'll get to this later on, I prefer to mix three meals of keto chow at a time using an immersion blender with melted butter. Um, you can just power through, mix up a whole bunch. Um, if you have two people working at it, one person can be getting the butter ready and melted while the other one is doing the mixing. And you can just go back and forth 
I think the, our record, my wife and I, we were able to do, I think, 12 for me and 9 for her. And it was about 10 minutes. So worked out really well. Um, and another interesting thing is, so if you, are, do, if you do do a all-liquid diet, you're not going to be chewing very much. Get some good sugar-free gum. Um, because I noticed that if I didn't chew any gum for about a week, week and a half, something like that, uh, my mouth would start to feel coated, would be the best description of it. Um, and all I had to do is chew some gum, that went away, everything was fine. Um, about two thirds of the way through this 100 day experiment, I did go to the dentist and get a crown on my lower right jaw and it still hurts. Um, if I chew gum, it's still actually quite painful. It's gotten a lot better, um, so I don't think that there's an actual problem, I just think it's very sensitive. Um, oddly enough, I got a crown on my upper left. Can't even feel it. It was, I got that one done like two, three weeks ago and it's fine. It was fine the next day. I don't know if it's just the difference between upper molars and lower molars or I just got lucky on this one or what, but anyway, so if you do have any pending dental work that needs to be done, doing it while you're having an all liquid diet, good time to do it. Anyhow, so let's talk about the results. So with heavy whipping cream, which is kind of, it's been the gold standard, um, tastes fantastic um, unless you are uh, lactose intolerant, everybody seems to love it. Um, and it's fairly inexpensive-ish. So doing it with uh, heavy whipping cream, it, well, I, I like the, the way that my HDL and my triglycerides react to the saturated fat. Um, I, as far as like LDL, LDLC, LDLP, total cholesterol, all of that, I don't really care about those figures at all. And if you want to get more into what those mean, I highly suggest going to cholesterolcode.com. Once again, that's cholesterolcode.com. Um, Dave Feldman and Siobhan Huggins do an amazing job. Mostly Dave, but Siobhan helps a lot too. I won't discount you, Siobhan, don't worry. Um, they do an amazing job at explaining the nuances of uh, the lipid system from an engineering and systemic point of view, rather than a dogmatic, um, this is way, the way that we've always looked at it ever since Ansel Keys lied about the results of his seven country study. I'll just drop that one right there. Um, anyhow, I like the results that I get with the primarily saturated fat that you get with heavy whipping cream. Um, works really well for me. I can tolerate lactose just fine, so, that's the one that I tend to go with. Um, my blood tests with it, heavy whipping cream look good. I have lower triglycerides, usually under about 100. Uh, my HDL is usually closer to 46, 47, closer to 50. I'd like that higher um, in the uh, upper 60s or even higher than that, but I don't, I don't think I'm cut out for that. We'll see. Um, but given the amount of saturated fat I'm eating, most experts in the lipid field would probably assume that I'm dead already. I'm not. In fact, it looks a lot worse when I eat um, candy and sugar and other mm, carbohydrates. So, now with avocado oil, avocado oil is primarily monounsaturated fat. Um, and in previous ex experiments, I had been trying to look at the results of those monounsaturated fats um, by using macadamia nut oil uh, in isolation. Um, and then this all goes back to an earlier test I did where I was stuck in San Francisco for a week with a bottle of avocado oil and some keto chow, which had a, it was a prototype version of keto chow that had some powdered MCT oil in it. Um, when I came back from that trip, um, well, first off, I'd gotten my ketones uh, my blood ketones all the way up to 5.8 millimolars per liter, um, which is astoundingly high. 
especially since I don't ever use exogenous ketone supplements. I think they're unnecessary for what I'm trying to accomplish, which is primarily weight loss. Um, if I had a neurological condition or I was an elite athlete, that might be a different story. Uh, but in this case, I'm just trying to lose weight and maintain it. Um, when I came back from that, my blood markers were really off the chart. My triglycerides had doubled. Um, yeah, and I didn't know what it was. I did another experiment. I did another experiment. I had um, three other people do a, a portion of one of my experiments. Um, then with this experiment right here, so the avocado oil alone, it did bring down my HDL. Um, my triglycerides didn't go up very much, but a little. Um, but the big thing that it did was it made my, well, once I switched to avocado oil with MCT, that's where I saw a huge increase, a market, let's see, what was it? Uh, a 58% increase in triglycerides doing avocado oil with MCT versus doing avocado oil alone. Um, Beverly, which, I'm sorry I haven't talked about much throughout this, um, she is record doing her own um, posts as well, um, so I, she'll probably give her take on it also, but looking at the biomarkers, um, she saw a 34% increase. And as I said earlier, my, my reactions to the different types of fats tended to be a bit more pronounced, although, you know, they were similar. The graphs follow similar curves and trends in a lot of the biomarkers. Um, and, wait, oh yes, and what I did, now previously I had done a, uh, a week of liquid coconut oil. Sorry, I was reading my own notes and I'm like, well that says an increase in HDL. Doing the uh, um, avocado oil with MCT, I saw a pronounced decrease in HDL. It actually made me really concerned. Uh, my HDL got all the way down to 26. Um, that's not good, <laughs> is, the, is the simple version of it. You want your HDL quite a bit higher than that. Um, and when I did uh, keto chow with liquid coconut oil, which the liquid coconut oil I was using was about half, about 50% MCTs, but the other half was really high quality saturated fats. Um, in this case, I wasn't pairing it with those saturated fats. And so I think that there was, well, which is odd because medium chain triglycerides are saturated fats as well. Um, but I did, I, when I did the liquid coconut oil, there was a, a really big increase in HDL. I think it was the highest number I'd ever gotten uh, before. Uh, but in this case, doing it with, um, avocado oil, I did not see that increase. I actually saw a huge decrease. Um, so it seems that if pairing MCT oil with avocado oil tends to, well, it really messes things up. Now, to back up a little bit, when I had been doing keto, uh, the uh, weight loss only phase, I was using heavy cream, heavy whipping cream to be specific, with, um, with M MCT oil. Just, a, well, 15 milliliters per meal. Um, but the saturated fat, again, seems to have offset some of the results. So, anyhow, um, I, well, big takeaway from that, I do not plan to use avocado oil with MCT again in the future. I do not like the way that it impacted my blood work at all. Um, now, avocado oil is nice because it has fewer net carbs. Uh, than compared to heavy whipping cream, but I don't particularly like the flavor of it. Some people prefer it. Um, I don't like the flavor of it, and um, while we were at Low Carb Denver, I discovered that if I used a blender to mix up the avocado oil, it would emulsify a lot better and mix in, uh, which led me to an epiphany that maybe I could do the same thing with butter and keto chow, with a blender and some warm water. Because up until that point, the plan was I was going to be doing butter for two weeks, but I thought that I was going to have to do the savory, well, the savory chicken soup and the prototype um, beef protein flavors 
of keto chow. Well, with this epiphany, I tested it out. Uh, turns out you can mix up butter warm with, with uh, warm water and stick it in a blender bottle and put it in the fridge and it will not separate. The butter stays in suspension. Um, you can drink it hot if you want to. You can heat it back up in like a mug or you can just drink it straight, which is what I ended up doing for most of the meals of butter. Now, butter is interesting stuff. So it's primarily a saturated fat. Um, in fact, I'm going to uh, refer to my notes here. 63% um, of the fat by mass in butter is fully hydrogenated, stable, saturated fat. And for those that don't know, the definition of a saturated fat is, okay, you have chains of carbon atoms with hydrogens on each side of them that it forms the chains. And the, uh, the type of fat is usually defined by how, or the number is defined by how many carbons there are. Um, a C8, a C10, well, those all have 10 or eight carbon atoms. When you get into C12, you start then talking about long chain fats. Um, eight and 10, those are medium chain fats. I think a six is a medium chain fat as well. And four and below are short chain fats, like butyrate. So butter, it has those chains, uninterrupted chains with all the hydrogen atoms filled in and no double bonds. A monounsaturated fat has a single double bond. So instead of having all the nice lined up, one of them has a double bond and that forms a kink in the molecular structure of the fat. And that allows it to stay liquid at a lower temperature, which is why a monounsaturated oil, like uh, olive oil or avocado oil or macadamia nut oil is, is generally going to, be, going to be liquid even in refrigeration. Um, whereas a saturated fat, such as butter or coconut oil, is generally going to be solid in, when refrigerated or at room temperature, depending on what part of the world you live in. Um, anyway, so then there are polyunsaturated fats, which have multiple double bonds, um, usually three or six or nine, depending on how it goes. Though, and every play, time there's a double bond, that's opening up the, the fat for oxidation. It, you, you'll, it'll break apart, oxygen will come in, hook into that, and the oil goes rancid, the fat goes rancid, and it develops that really weird smell that we don't like. Um, you don't want oxidized oils. It's a bad thing. And most polyunsaturated fats, the ones that are extracted from seeds and are generally called vegetable oils, they're not, they're not from vegetables, they're from plants, but they're not from vegetables at all, they're from seeds, because you don't find those except in the seeds. Um, and they have to extract them using solvents, they have to bleach them, they have to deodorize them, and they have to add preservatives to keep them from oxidizing quite so quickly, or else they go bad before they ever get to consumers. And the classic examples of polyunsaturated fats are soybean oil, um, peanut oil, canola oil to a lesser extent, uh, sunflower oil, things like that. They're, they're seed oils. Um, the ironic thing is polyunsaturated fats tend to cause LDL cholesterol to go down. The mechanism for them causing that to go down is still up, up for debate. Um, I've heard it theorized that one of the reasons that it goes down is because it is causing your cholesterol, um, their uh, uh, lipoproteins, your LDL, the low density lipoproteins that carry cholesterol. Uh, are damaged by the polyunsaturated fats to the extent that they have to be taken out of circulation. And to me, that doesn't sound like a good thing. Um, I, and they, uh, it's bandied about a lot about whether or not LDL particles are atherogenic in and of themselves, whether they cause atherosclerosis, 
or whether they are an indicator of damage, which is what I believe, um, if there's a lot of them around, or they you just happen to find them at places where things are going wrong. It's a lot like saying that police or firefighters are found, well, firefighters in this case, are found at the scene of fires. So firefighters must cause fires. No, they are there in a response to it. You do find LDL cholesterol, well, low-density lipoproteins, rather, um, at the scenes of... Uh, plaque in the arteries. Does that mean that they cause the plaque or that they're in a response to the plaque? Are they there to help heal it? Um, well, <laughs> there's a lot of good resources out there that indicate that they're there as a response. One is cause, one is effect. Regardless, um, polyunsaturated fats, or better phrased, polyunstable um, fats, well, they tend to cause LDL to go down, so they're seen by most of the medical community um, since the 1950s or so as protective against heart disease because they lower LDL. Well, I think that's a load of hooey. Regardless, my LDL did come down using um, avocado, well, using polyunsaturated fats in the previous experiment. I also had my plantar fasciitis come back because of the increased um, inflammation load that was being put on my body. I did not use polyunsaturated fats in this experiment because I did not want to do that to myself this time. Um, but yeah, so using butter, it's a stable saturated fat, 63%. Um, 25.92% um, of butter is monounsaturated fat. And uh, there is some polyunsaturated because you, in every naturally occurring fat, you get some of each. Um, now, oh yeah, it's 3.75% of, of the fat in butter is polyunsaturated, which is it's amazingly low. Um, now, of those stable saturated fats, you have a good number of short chain fats, 6.45% of the total fat. Um, medium chain, 7.77% of the total fat. Now I'm not talking about the saturated, I'm talking about the total fat is uh, medium chain. And 26.75% of all of the fat that you find in butter is C16. So it's 16 carbon atoms in a chain with hydrogens on all of them. Um, it's called palmitic acid, and it has what's known as an F to N ratio of 4.8. An F N ratio of 4.8 does really, really interesting things in your mitochondria and in your cells. Um, I won't get into it because it's a presentation in and, un in and of itself, um, but Dr. Michael Eads, if, he did a presentation at Breckenridge, in 2018. If you search for EADS, E-A-D-E-S, Breckenridge, um, I believe the name of the talk is a new theory for metabolism, something to that effect. But he lays forth some of the history of metabolic disorders and he actually gets into some of the, um, the mechanisms for how our body breaks down fats into energy and explains that this FN ratio, you're actually looking for a 0.48. And the closer, closer you get to that, it's this magical ratio that really is fantastic for your metabolism, uh, for fat metabolism, um, as far as how well it's converted into ketones and the oxidative load and everything like that. Um, there's also a link to his presentation in the blog post that, or just post that accompanies this. So, all in all, um, based on the blood test results that I got, uh, with butter raising my HDL, lowering my triglycerides, and just tasting absolutely fantastic, um, my, my, the way that I'm going to be eating my keto chow in, for the foreseeable future is using butter because it checks a lot of, it checks a lot of the boxes for me. Um, one of the criticisms that you'll find about uh, heavy cream is that it's actually heavy whipping cream, 
and that the whipping part of it is carrageenan and other emulsifiers that are made from seaweed. Um, a lot of people don't like those. Some people have some well-sourced, some rather outlandish claims, um, but I won't get into that. A lot of people just flat out don't like carrageenan and the other emulsifiers used in heavy whipping cream. You can completely sidestep that by using butter. It doesn't have any of that. Uh, generally, the ingredients for butter are going to be cream, and if you get salted butter, salt. That's it. That's the entirety of it. Um, it also costs less. Um, when I, uh, I priced out the cost of heavy cream, heavy whipping cream at my local grocery store, and I end up with a cost of a dollar and 22.9 cents per 1,000 calories for heavy whipping cream. Um, avocado oil was 98.1 cents per 1,000 calories, and butter ended up being 79.6 cents per 1,000 calories. Also interestingly enough, with the heavy whipping cream, you end up with uh, 8.35 grams of net carbohydrates, primarily lactose, in that 1,000 calories. Whereas with butter, you end up with 0 0.08 grams um, of total carbohydrates. Strangely enough, 0 0.08 grams is exactly how, many, how much sucralose is in a meal of keto chow, in case you wanted to know. Um, now, and also butter had a better impact on my blood markers, by far. Um, I much prefer the uh, results I got from that. Um, butter is easier to store. Um, it freezes exceptionally well and stays that way for a long time. You don't really, have to, really ever have to worry about it going bad unless your, your fridge goes bad. Um, also, if you get salted butter, it can go without refrigeration for a fairly good amount of time. Um, unsalted butter, not so much. Um, but you also don't have to worry about uh, it leaking out of the container that it's in. It's not in a glass bottle like you would want with a good avocado oil, um, and which, which would shatter, um, whereas the, the paper box of heavy cream sometimes leaks. Um, and it should also be noted that the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA, does not currently care at all about butter. You can put butter in your carry-on bag and they're not going to care. At all. It's just fine. So if you want to transport your keto chow and have your fat with you, not in a checked bag, you can totally do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and also, butter tastes absolutely amazing. Um, I haven't tried it in any one that I didn't like. Um, I've been using the salted butter because it has more sodium in it and I uh, prefer the extra salt. Um, that works exceptionally well with all the chocolate flavors that I've tried it with. Um, so chocolate toffee, chocolate mint, chocolate, chocolate peanut butter, all of those. And it also worked very well in the snickerdoodle and the eggnog flavors. I didn't like it very much in the I, I guess I should go back. I didn't like it in all of them. It, it, I, it wasn't my preferred thing with the um, raspberry cheesecake, and I think that might have been the extra salt. Uh, many people have reported that for the fruity flavors, such as um, the raspberry cheesecake, strawberry, and with the orange cream, um, if you use the unsalted butter, it works a lot better. So, uh, there you have it. Um, my conclusion from my 100-day experiment was, well, number one, I didn't die. <laughs> That's always good. Um, although, given the amount of saturated fat I've had in the last 100 days, now 106, um, conventional wisdom would say that I, I'm already dead. Um, I love the way that butter impacted my biomarkers. Um, and going forward, that's what I'm going to be using pretty much exclusively unless I need to use heavy cream for something else. I don't particularly like the taste of avocado oil and a lot of the benefits that um, I would see from avocado oil, chiefly the lower amounts of carbohydrates and such 
those are there with butter as well. The, the, the main drawback with butter is it is a little bit more work to prepare, but once you taste it, it's worth it. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, thank you all for joining me on this journey. If you're bored out of your mind, you've got about 100 and, well, it's about 92 videos that you can go back and watch. There were a couple that I missed, especially when I wanna, when I when we went camping, we had no signal, so no cell signal, and I completely spaced recording a video at all. I had planned to record them and then upload them later, but I was just enjoying camping. It was fantastic. Having keto chow while everyone else was having steak. Thank you very much. Oh, that steak's in the freezer. I need to eat that steak. Anyway. <laughs> Um, now, as far as going forward, I, I guess I should cover that. Um, right now, I'm primarily eating a keto chow and meat diet. Um, during the course of the experiment, a lot of people were like, hey, are you going to, uh, do you miss food? I'm like, nah, not really, I'm eating food. I mean, do you miss solid food? I miss, I missed um, smoked meat more than anything else. Um, and I didn't miss chewing because I had gum. Um, but now that I'm done with the experiment, well, I really like the, uh, the health benefits and the weight loss of doing keto chow for three meals a day. But with a family, that's very difficult to maintain and it's nice to have some flexibility. But going forward, I don't see any reason why not to primarily have keto chow for most of my meals and eating a bunch of meat. So that's, that's kind of my, my plan right now. Keto chow and meat. Occasional vegetables. I actually had a salad yesterday. It was the first salad I had had um, since January 1st. And it was mostly a little bit of lettuce with a lot of egg and cheese. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, there you go. Um, oh, I, so I guess I should have covered this. Uh, transitioning off um, liquid food was fine. I mean, I, uh, I jumped right into eating steaks and stuff and it was not an issue at all. Everyone was like, oh, your, your gut is going to be blah, blah, blah. And I was just absolutely fine. No issues whatsoever transitioning off liquid food to solid food. Um, I didn't have diarrhea. I didn't have stomach upset. The one thing that I encountered was that I was really full after eating a lot of meat which when I had been doing the 100 days of keto chow didn't really happen very often um, so that that's that's been just fine it is a little bit odd to be eating stuff that isn't just keto chow um, I do feel like I'm cheating somehow every time I go to eat something I'm like hee hee I hope nobody catches me <laughs> so anyway yeah, so again, thank you everybody for joining me on this uh, journey, and uh, yeah, that's about it. So long. <laughs>